OK, so now we're on to section 3.9, completions, quotients, and releases lemma. So what do you do if you've got an incomplete norm space? For example, suppose you've got the continuous functions, continuous uh, real or complex valued functions defined on the unit interval, but you've put the L1 norm on it. How do you complete it? Well, if you know about L1, then you would close it in space L1. If you don't know about space L1, then you'd quite like to know that you can embed it in some complete space anyway. So, to fit with that, you've got a if you've got a subspace of a Banach space, then you can complete it, adding in sort of as few elements as possible and preserving the norm on what you've got so far by just taking its closure in, in the Banach space you're in. And then you're dense in your closure. But if you're given some incomplete norm space, and you don't yet know a complete non-space it's a subset of, and then you want to know that you can complete it. So there are lots of, for example, there are an awful lot of norms you can put on C00, and some of them, it's not immediately obvious what Banach space you get that it's a subset of. It may be that, that when you complete it, you don't end up with a Banach space of sequences anymore. So, similarly, if you put some sort of norm on the polynomials, um, when you complete it, it's not at all obvious what sort of a, a space you end up with. So what is this notion of completion when you don't actually have a Banach space that you're a subset of yet? Well, first of all, I'll tell you what a completion should be, and then we'll make sure that you really can do it. So you start with some norm space, and you don't know what it is, and, and it's not particularly a subset of a Banach space at the moment. But a completion, if you can find one, of E, is some Banach space E tilde together with some isometric linear map I, though some people write iota, I'll use an I. Um, but if you want to use the Greek iota, then you can just throw away the dot. That maps E isometrically into E tilde, and we'd like the image to be dense. That is... That corresponds to, you know, if you're just taking the closure, then your embedding is just the identity map, and the inclusion map as a subset. In general, you might not get away with that if you don't know you're actually a subset of some Banach space yet. So I'll point out that you really do have completions in a minute. One way to do it, if you don't want to use harm banach theorem and therefore don't want to be using some sort of version of the active of choice, you don't need the active of choice. Well, what you can do is you can look at all Cauchy sequence in your space. Then you can form equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences, um, those which ought to tend to the same thing if only they converged. And then that set of equivalence classes can be made into a norm space, which turns out to be complete, and you embed in it. And this is actually a standard procedure for completing any metric space. You've got any metric space that's not necessarily complete yet. You can look at all the Cauchy sequences. That's a nice big set of sequences. And then you can look at equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences. And there's only one sort of sensible equivalence relation you can put on Cauchy sequences to decide whether or not they ought to tend to the same thing. And then that set of equivalence classes can be made into a metric space in a nice way and it turns out to be complete, and your metric space embeds isometrically in it. So that's a, a standard procedure. It doesn't need the axiom of choice and, and defines the completion anyway. Um, but given what we've already said, we have a, a soft option, um, soft in as much as uh, you don't have to do all that extra work with the Cauchy sequences, because we know, using the Harm-Banach theorem, that E embeds isometrically in E double dual. An E double dual is a Banach space. So you look at that embedding, well, it may not be dense in E double dual, but it'll be dense in its closure. So you can take the closure of the image 
of, uh, under the canonical mapping. So you've got x goes to x hat, our natural mapping from E go into E double star. And then use the closure of the image of E. Then this is an isometric linear embedding into that closure, and it's got dent range because that's the closure. Um, and that's what you do. So what can you get from completions? You get some rather nice properties about automatic extensions. This is very similar to what we already did before. We know that bounded linear operators always extend to closures. Now completions are a bit like closures, um, except that a sort of a general completion might not have anything to do with a closure if you did it with Cauchy sequences and so on. So. But nevertheless, in as much as completions are very like closures, it's not surprising that you can somehow extend the bounded linear operator on the space up to be defined on the completion. Now, what you actually have to do is factor through your inclusion. So what's going on here, let's have a commutative diagram. You've got E, and you've got E tilde, and you've got your inclusion map. Let's make a bit more room there. You've got your inclusion map here from E into E tilde, and now you've got some bounded linear operator going into some Banach space Y. Then you can think of T tilde as extending T because E tilde is a little bit bigger than E. If only this I was actually the inclusion map and it was a subset, then it would just be the same kind of extension we were talking about before. Um, of course, you don't have to write T tilde composed with I. Uh, we're allowed to write T tilde I because they're linear maps. So you don't have to write that composition sign. And uh, this is similar to the earlier result about extending to closures. So this could be a useful thing to do, you, you want to find an interesting Banach space and you put some interesting norm on C00, um, but unfortunately, of course, it has to be incomplete because it's C00. But then you can complete it, whatever norm you did, you can then complete it and you can get all sorts of weird and wonderful Banach spaces um, as a result. Now, because of that universal property, when you do these completions, they are pretty much unique. Um, so let's have a look. If you've got two different completions, so you've got your map I into um, one of its completions, and you've got a map J into a different completion, then that universal property I showed you earlier means that you can complete this diagram in both directions. You can form a map, um, let's get this right, J tilde going this way, and you can form map I tilde going this way, using the universal property, with J tilde composed with um, I equals J, and I tilde composed with J, uh, what am I doing? Yeah. I tilde composed of J equals I. That's applying the universal property we had before. And um, 
which of these is T? T is going from E tilde to F, so you take T equals J tilde. So the map you're guaranteed from the previous diagram um, turns out, in this case, to be an isometric isomorphism satisfying uh, this condition. So there's no real difference between any two completions. So you might as well use the one I said, close it in the double dual. All the other ones will be up to isometric isomorphism the same. Any, uh, any questions about what I said about completions? We're, we're going to move on to quotients and Reese's lemma. But are there any, anything you'd like to ask about the completions? Does that all seem reasonable? I left a few details out which you can check, but it's not very different from the stuff we had before about um, extending to the closure. So I, I'll leave those details for you. So exercise is to check omitted details. Well, this is always an exercise in any module, really. Okay, so that brings us on to quotient spaces of Reese's lemma. Now, earlier we discussed quotients of vector spaces, so we remember a lot about those. So this is a, a reminder here of our notation for this. So you've got a vector space E, and you've got a subspace F, we've got a quotient vector space E over F, with the quotient map from E to E over F, which takes each X to its equivalence class, which is the coset or translate X plus F. And we know this is a surjective linear map from E onto E over F. And we had a vector space isomorphism theorem earlier, and we'll be interested in looking for a Banach space isomorphism theorem a bit later, but there are some technical problems um, which we have to get through. And the norm space isomorphism theorem isn't true. Um, in as much as a continuous surjection of norm spaces doesn't have to become a sort of linear homeomorphism when you quotient out through the kernel. But fortunately, that problem doesn't arise for Banach spaces. So we will get a Banach space isomorphism theorem, but we won't get a norm space isomorphism theorem. So can we find a sensible way to put a norm on the quotient space E over F when you quotient out a subspace? Well, it turns out that this only really works to get a norm if F is a closed subspace. For example, if F is a dense subspace of E, then uh, really there isn't very much useful you can do here, um, at least not sensibly fitting with the original norm. The only sensible thing you could do is to define the trivial zero semi-norm on that quotient. If the um, semi-norms are like norms, but um, miss the uniqueness of zero norm bit. So a semi-norm that isn't a norm will, be, will have all the properties of norm, except that uh, there may be some elements whose semi-norm is zero, but which aren't equal to the zero element. And that's typically what happens if you try to quotient out by a subspace that isn't closed. So you normally end up with a semi-norm space. And as I've just said, that's just, that relates to norm just like pseudometric relates to metric. A semi-norm of an element can be zero without the element being zero. Possibly. Of course, it's every, just like every metric is a pseudometric, but not every pseudometric is a metric. Similarly, every norm is a semi-norm, but not every semi-norm is a norm. So... When I say it is possible, that depends on whether your semi-norm happens to be a norm or not. So what is the quotient semi-norm? Well, we take a typical element of the quotient, and a typical element of the quotient will be one of these translates. One of these translates or the equivalence class of some element y, modulo f. Well, we want to define something that makes sense um, 
And what we do is we look at all the things in the equivalence class and we take the inf of those norms. Now, it's not at all obvious what that really means. I think that perhaps one way of thinking about it that gives you a better idea is to say that the, the semi-norm of y is the distance from y to the subset f. Now, little exercise to check that that's the same, but uh, x is in y plus f if and only if y minus x is in f. And then y minus x takes you to f, so you're looking at the norms of x's which will take you into f, which sounds like you're looking at the distance to the set f, which is what you're doing. So you can check as an exercise, check that these are equal. And now you see the problem. If, if f isn't closed, then there'll be some elements of the space whose distance to f is zero, but which aren't in f. Because the closure of a set is the set of points whose distance to it is zero in a metric space. So there are going to be some things, unless f is closed, some of these things are going to have what looks like norm, but which is really a semi-norm, being equal to zero, without actually being the zero element. Now, of course, that's in terms of y in E, but you may want to go directly to an element psi in E over F. I like to use Greek letters when I'm, uh, uh, like psi, when I'm talking about an element of the quotient. Um, so if psi is in E over F, of course it means that psi is actually a coset. So I could just go back to the previous definition. And here are two different ways of saying it. And I like to think of it as the first one. The norm of psi is the interim of the norms of those x in E so that the tra that translate is psi. So you look at all those x's which give you the right translate and look for the interim of those norms. On the other hand, since psi is actually a set, you could just take the interim of the norms of the things which are in psi because psi is actually the translate. So psi actually is a translate of f, and so it's a set. And so you get the same thing. Now, if f is closed, then you're in luck that at least you can't get zero unless you are the zero element, because the distance from y to f will be zero if and only if y is in f, in which case the translate you're looking at is the zero element, namely f. y plus f is equal to zero plus f. So under those circumstances, you've got a chance that it's a norm rather than just a semi-norm. And then you have to check the details. And it works, but I'm leaving that as an exercise. So what do you have to check? You have to check that the norm of psi 1 plus psi 2 is less equal to norm psi 1. That's not a very good psi. plus norm psi 2. And that norm of alpha times psi is equal to mod alpha times norm psi. Um, and why is that true? Well, the, the constant multiple is not a surprise because we're talking vector spaces here. Um, you want to know how far you are from a subspace. Well, if you scale up, if you scale up an element, its distance to subspace is going to be scaled up by the right amount because you can estimate it using the scaled up things you use to estimate the original vector. So the scaling up is not a surprise. Um, for the sum, well, if you estimate psi 1 sort of as well as you can and psi 2 sort of as well as you can by doing one of these infinites, um, then you'll get a sequence of things that give you a good estimate for uh, psi 1 plus psi 2. And so that's where this one comes from. I can give more details if, on request, but you are allowed to assume that this thing is a norm.
if you want to see more details, I can, I can produce a handout. Of course, it's in all the books, so, so it's, and it's not a very hard exercise. But we'll use this quotient norm to help us when we do Reese's lemma. Uh, it seems to be quite standard to prove Reese's lemma, which we'll talk about in a moment, directly the first time you see it, and not note its connection with the quotient spaces. I'm not quite sure why that is, because it seems to me that it, it really fits extremely closely with the notion of quotient spaces. OK, so what's, what next? I'm going to try not to put all my subscripts in, like norm sub x, norm sub y, norm sub e, and so on, uh, because uh, we should learn to recognize in context where the norm is being taken. And so it's, it's traditional in the theory of Banach spaces and so on just to write norm all the time, unless there is a really serious ambiguity and you really want to make it very clear which norm you're using. So certainly in the abstract theory, you normally just write norm all the time because you know which Banach space your element's in, or norm space, and so there won't be any ambiguity. Whereas if you're working in a concrete space like like little l1 or something, or little n infinity, perhaps you will still use the, uh, the appropriate norm symbol for that. So our next task is to prove Reese's geometric lemma and to show that some, there's something very different about infinite dimensional norm spaces. In finite dimensional norm spaces, the closed unit ball is closed and bounded so it's sequentially compact. And in infinite dimensional norm spaces, the closed unit ball is closed and bounded, and so it is not combat, unfortunately. Um, which just goes to show that heine borel theorem is not true in any infinite dimensional norm space. And you'll find Reese's lemma proved directly, but we're going to prove it using the quotient norm. So it's Reese's lemma or Reese's geometric lemma. It basically says if you've got a proper closed subspace of a norm space, then you can find an element whose norm is 1 and whose distance to the subspace is very nearly 1. So this sort of makes sense. It's a proper closed subspace. What you're looking for is a good direction to go off in, um, which is you should think of it as almost perpendicular to your subspace. You know, um, if, if you're dealing with a Hilbert space, that's what you would do. You would, if you had a proper closed subspace and you were dealing with a Hilbert space, you'd go off in a perpendicular direction to a vector. Uh, you would just go away from the origin to a vector norm 1 perpendicular to your subspace, and that would have the correct distance from your subspace exactly. You'd actually achieve an x with norm 1 whose distance was equal to 1. Now, we don't claim that in general, and you can't always do it. You are okay in finite dimensional spaces, um, using a sort of little compactness argument. Um, and actually, that's uh, what we're going to, the finite dimensional spaces version is the one we're going to use in a moment. So you can actually achieve one there, though I'll do it with the 1 minus epsilon rather than doing that little extra argument. Uh, but in general, given everything in sight may be infinite dimensional, all you get is that the distance from x to f will be nearly 1, and that x will be on the unit sphere. Norm x will be 1. But you should think of it as being almost... Uh, if you think of this as f, and here's 0, and here's your unit sphere, and here's your point x, so norm x equals 1, Well, in an ideal world, you'd be able to achieve distance 1 to f. In fact, you may not be able to do that, but you can get greater than 1 minus epsilon. Now, what's this about if f is a finite dimensional subspace? Well, if f is a finite dimensional subspace, then f is automatically closed. And assuming E isn't finite dimensional, then of course um, 
it'll we'll get f not equal to e automatically. But if e is finite dimensional, then what you're talking about is a, a proper finite dimensional subspace of a finite dimensional space. You can still do this, and it's quite a nice trick to try and find a point in the unit sphere that's a long way away from your proper subspace, even though you may be dealing with some weird norm. So I'm going to prove that for you, and then corollary 3.40, that if you've got an infinite dimensional norm space, the closed unit ball is never compact. So let's start by proving Reese's lemma. Let me just get uh, a copy in front of me so that I don't change notation in the middle. So we're going to use the quotient norm. So remember, F is a proper closed subspace of E. So E over F with the quotient norm is a non-trivial norm space. Meaning that it hasn't just got the er zero element in. So let's let psi be an E over F with norm psi equal 1. That's the quotient norm. Of course. That's using the non-trivialness. If E equals F, then you couldn't do this because you'd have the zero space. But F isn't E, and F is closed, so you can do this. But then, this is equal to the distance of any element of psi. So, um, anything in psi, so for all x in psi, the distance from x to f is equal to 1. What do I mean by that? That's, uh, that looks a bit strange. OK, that's for all, that's x in E with x plus f equals psi. Remember, psi is a translate. Uh, but the norm of psi, that's 1, it's also equal to the infimum of the norm of x, this time taken in E, where x plus f equals psi, or x is in psi. So let's choose... Choose x in E with x plus f equals psi so that 1 over norm x is greater than 1 minus epsilon. Then Um, oh, I can't use y. I can't use x because that's supposed to be in the state of the lemma. Let's have a, call that y, sorry. You can do that because you can get y close enough to 1 that 1 over norm y is greater than 1 minus epsilon. You can, you can get the norm of y as close to 1 as you like because it's an infinite. We'll set x equals 
y of a norm y, 1 over norm y times y, then norm x is 1, and distance from Um, x to f is equal to 1 over norm y times the distance of y to f um, which is equal to 1 over y because the distance of y to f was 1. Remember, although I used x earlier, I said, let's just bring that back, Remember, for every x which gives you the right translate, the distance is 1. We use, we're applying that to y here, so you're getting 1 over norm y. And that's greater than 1 minus epsilon. So we've done it. So I've just used the definition of quotient norm, taken any unit vector in the quotient, and used that to show that you can find vectors in the original with norm 1, whose distance to space is very nearly 1, because that's how quotient norm behaves. You can find things which have got nearly the right distance, which give you, uh, which have got nearly the right norm, that give you the right distance. Well, is that what I'm trying to say? Right. And so now we're in a position to prove that corollary about every infinite dimensional norm space, the closed unit ball is never sequentially compact. So E is an infinite dimensional norm space. Choose any unit vector to be x1. So let x1 in E with norm x1 equals 1. We could do that. Since E is infinite dimensional, it's not the zero norm space. That's our first vector. So f1 to be the linear span of x1. That's a finite dimensional subspace of E, so it's closed. It's not equal to E, so then F1 is automatically closed because it's finite dimensional. And of course, F1 is not equal to E because it's finite dimensional and E is infinite dimensional. So by Reese lemma, And we won't go for very, very nearly one. We'll just do better than a half, because that's good enough for us. But you can get as close to one as you like, but I'm going to be satisfied with a half. We can choose x2 in E with norm x2 equals one, and the distance from x2 to f1 is greater or equal to a half. As I said, we can beat 1 minus epsilon, we can certainly beat a half. Now, this is how we proceed. So having chosen x1, x2, up to xn in E, here's how we choose xn plus 1. We choose xn plus 1 as follows. You set fn to be the linear span of x1 up to xn. 
that will be a finite dimensional subspace of E, so it's closed and not equal to E. So what do we do? We apply a wreath lever to choose x n plus 1. x n plus 1 in E with norm x n plus 1 equals 1. And distance from x n plus 1 so the linear spans of the first lot um, distance to Fn is at least a half. In other words, distance from Xn plus 1 to the linear span of the first lot is at least a half. And this way we choose a sequence of unit vectors in E with some interesting properties. This gives the sequence Xn in E such that norm Xn is 1 for all n. But that distance from xn plus 1 to the previous ones is always at least a half. Now, remember, metric spaces, compactness and sequential compactness are the same. Uh, so, we can use, we can do either way now. We can, we can either prove now that the thing is not compact, but it's better to probably prove that it's not sequentially compact. Um, let's have a look at this sequence Xn. All of the terms are at least a half from each other. Because, in particular, um, norm of Xn plus 1 minus xk has to be at least a half for 1 small equal to k small equal to n and that's for all natural numbers n. In other words any two of these different vectors are at least distance a half apart and that means no subsequence can converge. Thus if I just rewrite that as norm xj minus xk is greater than half for j not equal to k in the natural numbers. So, no subsequence of the xn can converge. Even in x, even in e. So, this immediately shows that the closed unit board is not sequentially compact and the closed unit sphere is not sequentially compact. In fact, any, um, anything, any subset of E which has got this sequence in is not sequentially compact. In particular, um, the closed unit ball in E, which is B E of naught 1, is not sequentially compact and so it's not compact. So, quite a dichotomy there. 
Um, finite dimensional spaces, all norms are equivalent. The closed unit board is always compact. Infinite dimensional norm spaces, uh, norms don't have to be equivalent, but the closed unit board is never compact. Quite a difference. Any questions about any of the things we've been discussing today? If not, then I think that would be a good place to stop.